So in today's module, uh, we will go on and talk about the next postulate of quantum mechanics. This is also called the measurement postulate by some. Um, and in some sense, this is the uh, postulate that you know shows a very radical departure from classical mechanics, even though the first two postulates also do. Uh, before we move on to the statement of what this postulate is, uh, please uh, revise the notions of Hermitian operators and probability amplitude that we covered in earlier lectures. In particular, you should be well versed with the notion of Hermitian operators and the fact that they only have real eigenvalues and that Hermitian operators have eigenfunctions that are orthonormal. Okay, if you're talking about Hermitian matrices, they have eigenvectors that are orthonormal. Uh, they're orthogonal to each other and they can be normalized to unity. The second is the notion of probability amplitude. Um, uh, remember that we discussed this during our second lecture, uh, or third lecture, I think, when we discussed the double slit experiment. Uh, basically, for any event to occur in, in, in quantum mechanics, we ascribe to that particular event a, an amplitude, which is generally a complex number phi, and the probability that this event will occur this particular way is given by the absolute square of that amplitude, which is mod phi square. Okay, so these two concepts are things that we would be using in today's module as well. So let us now move on to the statement of the postulate. Postulate three it tells you that the only possible outcome outcomes of measurement of any observable, let's call this observable Q, are the eigenvalues of the corresponding Hermitian operator Q hat. Okay, so there is a lot to unpack in this particular statement. First of all, uh, understand that what this basically is telling you is that if you want to measure something, then quantum mechanics, even before you do the act of measurement, quantum mechanics basically intervenes and tells you that, wait a second, you cannot get anything that you want. You can only get a specific number of outcomes. And what are these outcomes? These particular results of experimentation, quantum mechanics tells you, would be one of the eigenvalues of the corresponding operator Q, corresponding to that particular observable Q, okay? Now, eigenvalues can be a discrete set or a continuous set. A continuous set basically means there is an infinite number of possibilities. An example of a continuous set is X operator and P operator. Both X operator and P operator have a continuous set of eigenvalues. The position and momentum can be anything from minus infinity to plus infinity. Maybe in those cases, it is intuitively still not very bothersome because there is an infinity of numbers to choose from, but there are operators that only have a discrete spectrum, which only have, let us say, an operator is described by a four by four matrix, right? Which only has four eigenvalues. Now quantum mechanics tells you that if you're trying to measure this particular observable, which in quantum mechanics is represented by a four by four Hermitian matrix, then even before you do the experiment, I know that you will only get one of those four possible values. Okay. This is highly counterintuitive and is a radical departure from the laws of classical mechanics. So today's module would be to give you the rules by which you can compute the probability amplitudes of measurement of any observable Q. Okay, so to do this, let us start with a very simple uh, example. Example. Okay, and then using this example, we will try to un unpack the meaning of this postulate. Now, first, let me take a specific Hermitian operator. Let me call the Hamiltonian operator, which is a Hermitian operator. And let us say that it has a matrix form a two by two matrix form 
uh, which is something that we already discussed in this lecture. So we'll take this ex very same example, zero i minus i and zero. Okay, I've put in the E zero for dimensional purposes. Now we have already diagonalized this uh, matrix. So this Hamiltonian, which, which measures the energy of a system in some uh, quantum mechanical system, we do not care which system, it's just a random example. You know that there can be two possible eigenvalues. What are the eigenvalues? The eigenvalues can be plus one or minus one, but since I've multiplied this by E zero, there is a plus E zero and a minus E zero. These are the two possible eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian operator. Now, the eigenvalue E zero has um, some eigenvector associated with it. I will call this eigenvector V one, which again, you know to be one over root two, one minus one. And this is V two plus one over root two, one I. Okay, so these are the two eigenvalues and these are the two eigenvectors corresponding to this Hermitian matrix H, which measures the energy of a system. All right. So basically quantum mechanics tells you that if you are going to be doing observations on this particular system and you're going to measure the energy of the system, of this, this is a particle in some kind of a force field, I do not know then it tells you that you can only get two eigenvalues, uh, two values of energy even before you measure it. You can either get the answer E0 or you can get the answer minus E0, even before you step into the laboratory to measure this. All right, so what does this mean? So let us say that postulate number one of quantum mechanics told you that the state of a physical system is dictated by some uh, function of x and t, and this is called the wave function of the system. Now, since we are adapting this to a two by two matrix example, let us call the state of a physical system as some vector v for this uh, two dimensional case, which means instead of a wave function, I'm using the notion of vectors. We'll also talk about wave functions shortly in the second example. So let's call this, um, let's call this example one. Now, let me say that the state of the system is represented by some vector v, okay? I do not know what this v is, but here comes the first point. Notice that all Hermitian operators have eigenfunctions that are orthonormal. In that sense, they are complete as a basis. I can use them as a basis set. So suppose if I'm trying to measure the energy of the system and I know that the system is in some state v, it helps me to write the state V as a linear combination of the eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian operator. Why? Remember that the eigenvectors of a Hermitian operator being orthonormal provide you with a basis set, okay? So I can always express any vector in this two dimensional space as a linear combination of these two basis vectors. I can choose the basis vectors to be zero, one or one zero, that is perfectly fine. Or for the problem at hand, it's easier for me to choose the eigenvectors as V1 and V2. So I can express any vector as a linear combination of the basis vectors and the eigenvectors of a Hermitian matrix give you automatically a nice set of basis vectors. So let me describe the state of a system as some linear combination of the eigenvectors of the H operator. Okay, this is the first point. This is where the first point comes in, the notion of Hermitian operators and orthonormal eigenvectors comes in. Now notice that this second uh, point of real eigenvalues is also important because the measurement is a real quantity. Anything that you measure in a laboratory has to be real. Now when quantum mechanics tells you that the only possible outcomes of a measurement are the Eigen, eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator, it automatically guarantees that whatever you measure is a real quantity, right? So you cannot measure some quantity and get a value three plus two i in a lab. That, that doesn't make any sense. It's not a physical observable. So the notion of an observable being represented by a Hermitian operator, the Hermitian word is very important, is crucial in quantum mechanics because the eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator are guaranteed to be real, as we demonstrated a week or so ago. All right, 
So the state of this physical system is represented by V vector, which I have written as a linear combination of the basis vectors V1 and V2. Very good. So suppose if I have a system which is described by this vector V, which is given by some A1, V1 plus A2, V2. And now quantum mechanics tells me that if I measure the energy of the system, I'll only get two possible values, okay? But what can these possible values be? E0 and minus V0, E0. So what is the probability amplitude associated with getting the value E0? And what is the corresponding probability? And what is the probability amplitude associated with the value minus E0? What is the corresponding probability? Now, you might be a little curious as to how we are moving on from uh, writing down a vector and, uh, and to the notion of a probabilistic measurement. So this is how an idealistic measurement happens in quantum mechanics. The way we think about measurement in quantum mechanics is as follows. Now, when I say that the system exists in some um, state V, and when I talk about probabilities of measurement, here's what I mean. I mean that in my mind, I have set up an idealistic scenario where I have set up this, I have prepared the same system with the same vector V uh, with multiple copies of them, okay? This is called in physics an ensemble. So I'm taking what is called an ensemble average. That is what I mean by the notion of probability. So suppose if I make the exact same copies of the physical system whose energy I want to measure, like 15 billion copies of it, and I have 15 billion very eager students who want to measure the energy, I'll send all of them with identically prepared systems, okay? And now I will ask them to measure the energy. Now a whole bunch of them can get energy E0 and a whole bunch of them can get energy minus E0, right? Both these values are allowed by quantum mechanics. None of them will get any value other than E0 or minus E0. So the question is, what is the amount, number of students who will get the value E0 and what is the number of students who will get the value minus E0? Okay, so we have to develop a rule to uh, measure these two probabilities. So how do we measure them? So here's the way you measure this. So notice that V1 is the eigenvector corresponding to the first eigenvalue E0 and V2 is the eigenvector corresponding to the second eigenvalue E0, okay? Now, you ask yourself, what is the amount of V1 in V and what is the amount of V2 in V? Okay, this question you can easily answer because you know how to project vectors. So to understand what is the amount of V1 in V, all I have to do is take the dot product of v, V1 with V. So I should simply take V1 dot V, okay? What is this? This is A1 V1 dot V1 plus A2 V1 dot V2, right? Now, since these are vectors, what I'm really doing is V1 transpose V, and this is equal to V1 transpose V1 plus A2 V1 transpose V2. Now notice that V1 and V2 are orthogonal to each other, so the second term identically vanishes. Now V1 and V2 are normalized to unity, so V1 dot V1 itself is one, right? So the amount of V1 in my system V is simply given by A1, okay? So since V1 is the eigenvector associated with the energy eigenvalue E0, I claim that the probability amplitude that I will get the value E0 in this uh, idealized experiment is the number A1. And the probability that I will get the value E0 is mod A1 square. okay? Now this crucially rests on the fact that V1 and V2 are orthogonal, so I can use the projection in this easy fashion. Similarly, the probability of getting the value minus E0 
the second eigenvalue, as you can easily guess, is mod a2 square. Okay. Now there is a caveat to this. This assumes that I have actually normalized B itself, right? If B is not normalized, you should first normalize B. So how do you normalize B? So B, which is A1, V1, plus A2, V2, okay? For example, A1 is one over root two and A2 is one over root two, it's automatically normalized. However, if they are not properly normalized, I will go ahead and normalize. The first step is to normalize B. Normalize vector B. Okay, how do I normalize? I will simply compute what is V dot V or V transpose V. This is simply equal to A1 square plus A2 square. Now I should write mod A1 square plus mod A2 square, but I will assume that A1 and A2 are real for now, okay, without loss of generality. So the length of this vector is square root of a1 square plus a2 square. So if I construct this vector v by dividing by the length, I will have a1 divided by square root of a1 square plus a2 square times v1 plus a2 divided by square root of a1 square plus a2 square times v2. Then this is a properly normalized vector. Okay, so it's always useful to work with normalized vectors. Now I can ask the exact same question again. What is the probability of finding the value E0? And this would be the coefficient of V1 squared. So this would be A1 squared by A1 squared plus A2 squared. The probability of finding the value minus E0 is A2 squared divided by A1 squared plus A2 squared. And remember that a whole bunch of students should get the value E0, the whole bunch of students should get a value minus E0, the total probability, which is the sum of these two guys, has to be one. A2 square plus A2 square over A1 square plus A2 square, which is neatly one, okay? So properly normalizing the ve uh, vector uh, automatically ensures that you don't get any nonsensical total probabilities, okay? So as a practical measure, the way you compute the probability amplitude given the state of the system is to express the state of a system as a linear combination of the eigenvectors of the Hermitian observable or Hermitian operator that you're interested in. And you simply extract the corresponding coefficients and call them the probability amplitudes. And then you take the absolute square of those probability amplitudes and you get the probability of the measurement. So in our case, suppose if you had a very simple two-dimensional system and you prepared one billion identical copies of the system and you had a whole bunch of people measure the energy of the system, the postulate number three of quantum mechanics tells you that many of these guys will get a value E0 and many of these guys will get a value minus E0. And quantum mechanics also helps you figure out what is the probability of uh, getting a value E0, what is the probability of getting a value minus E0? The way you actually compute this probability is by expressing V as a linear combination of V1 and V2, and then normalizing V if it is not already normalized, and then extracting the coefficients by taking the proper dot products. Okay, so this is the rule that you have to follow in order to uh, understand the notion of probability and how to extract different probabilities in quantum mechanics. So let's work out a slightly uh, complicated example. So let us say that you have uh, some system which is given by a wave function, which is given by psi equals, let us say, one over root 19 pi one. These pi ones are functions of x and t, of course. Two over root nine. so these are not just ordinary vectors anymore. plus square root of three over 19, a very random wave function. Okay. Now what are these phi's? These phi's I claim are the eigenfunctions of a Hamiltonian operator. And the eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian operator is h acting on phi n equals n epsilon zero phi n. Okay, what does this mean? This means that Phi two is an eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian with energy value two E zero. Phi four is an 
eigenvalue, eigenfunction of Hamiltonian with energy eigenvalue 4e0 and so on and so forth. Okay. So I'm expressing the state of a system in terms of a wave function psi, which I have expressed as a linear combination of all the different uh, eigenfunctions of a Hamiltonian. Why Hamiltonian nothing else? Well, because I want to measure the energy. If I wanted to measure something else, I will express the state of a system as a linear combination of the eigenvectors of that particular observable that I'm interested in measuring. Okay. So first let us ask the same question. So if the energy is measured on a large number of identical systems that are all in the same state psi, what values would one obtain for the energy and with what probabilities? So let us compute the energies and probabilities. Okay. So to compute that first, notice that psi is not normalized. Okay. How do you know that? Well, since it is a function, you have to understand the notion of probability. Uh, <clears throat> normalization is psi star psi dx, right? So what is psi star psi dx? Psi star psi dx is integral this whole thing with all the phi one star, right? So one over square root of 19, phi one star, plus blah, 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 square root of phi over 19, phi phi star, times one over square root of 19, phi one, plus blah, 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 square root of phi over 19, phi phi dx. Okay, so if the function is properly normalized, this has to be one. Now notice that since phi one, phi two, phi three, phi four, phi five are eigenfunctions of a Hermitian operator, they are all orthonormal to each other, right? In other words, phi one star phi two dx is zero. Similarly, phi one star phi three, phi one star phi four, phi two star phi four, everything is zero. And phi one star phi one dx is one. Okay, and so on and so forth. So I can combine this rule by saying that phi n star phi m dx is delta nm. This is called the Kronecker delta. This takes the value zero if n is not equal to m and one if n equals m. Okay, so this represents the orthonormality of the phi's. Remember that phi is eigenfunctions, they are functions of x and t. Okay, so the so psi is not normalized, but that's all right. I can always normalize it. How do you normalize it? Well, you simply compute psi star psi, whatever it is, and you may uh, multiply the psi by inverse of square root of that function. So, I mean, square root of that number. So, if you normalize psi, you would actually find that you have to multiply it by square root of 19 over 15. Okay, times one over square root phi one, two over square root 19 phi two. So square root of two over 19 phi three plus square root of three over 19 phi four, plus square root of phi over 19 phi phi. Okay. I think this problem is an example from a quantum mechanics book by uh, the author is Italy, but I'm, I could, I'm not sure. Okay, so this is the properly normalized wave function. Now, what are the energy eigenvalues that one can get? Well, quantum mechanics postulate number three tells us the energy eigenvalues can be energy measurements can give you values e0, 2e0, 3e0, 4e0, and 5e0, nothing else, okay? So again, I prepared the system in uh, identical fashion, a whole bunch of copies of them, and I send a whole bunch of people to measure the energies and a sub subset of them measure E0, subset of them measure 2E0, a subset of them measure 3E0 and so on and so forth. Now I want to understand what are the probabilities associated with each of these measurements. Again, how do you compute the probability? You project out that particular part of the vector or the wave function. For example, phi2 is the eigenfunction corresponding to eigenvalue 2e0. 
So what is the probability of finding 2E0? I will simply project out that particular component from the wave function. Um, so first, I will calculate this in two steps. I will calculate the probability amplitude <coughs> excuse me, of measuring 2E0. The probability amplitude of measuring 2E0 is simply the projection. So this is simply equal to integral. Let us say I'm calculating 2E0. So I'll take phi 2 star psi dx. Okay. Now, if I do this, since psi is a linear combination of phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4, and phi 5, phi 2 star phi 1 would be integral phi 2 star phi 1 would be 0 because of the orthonormality condition here. Yeah. Um, and uh, phi 3 star phi 2 would be 0, and phi 2 star uh, phi 5 would be 0. Everything would be 0 except phi 2 star phi 1. And integral phi 2 star phi, uh, ex sorry, excuse me, except integral phi 2 star phi 2, and integral phi 2 star phi 2 dx is just 1. Okay, so let's actually do this out explicitly in case you're having a little difficulty for doing the statement. So this is equal to square root 19 over 15. I'll keep that as it is times 1 over square root 19 integral phi 2 star phi 1 dx plus 2 over square root 19 integral phi 2 star phi 2 dx plus square root of 2 over 19 integral phi 2 star phi 3 dx plus square root 3 over 19 integral phi 2 star phi 4 dx plus square root phi over 19 integral phi 2 star phi 5 dx. Okay. And since the wave fun the, the eigenfunctions are orthogonal, this vanishes, this vanishes, this vanishes, and this vanishes. And this guy integral phi 2 star phi 2 dx is just 1. Okay. So ultimately, the probability amplitude, which is just the projecting out that particular eigenvector from the state of the system is given by, in this case, square root of 19 over 15 times 2 over square root 19, which is given by 2 over square root 15. Okay. This is the probability amplitude of getting the value 2e0 the probability of getting the value to E0 is the absolute square of this number. This number is just real, so I can take the actual square of this number, which is 4 divided by 15. Okay? So similarly, you can calculate P of E0, which is, I think, 115. P of 2 E0 which we have calculated as 415. P of 3 is 0. Uh, I encourage you to calculate all these things separately in case you're not sure, or you can just read it off because this is a simple enough example. P of 4 is 0 is given by 3 15th, and P of 5 is 0 is given by 5 over 15. And if you add all these guys, you get 1 plus 4, 5 plus 2, 7 plus 3, 10 plus 5, 15 over 15, which is 1. So the total probability is 1 as it should be. Okay, this is always a useful check to do at the end of your calculations. Now, we have we were, uh, talked about the individual energy measurements and their probabilities. You can also talk, since we are uh, preparing a large number of copies of the same system, we can also talk about the notion of average energy. Okay, so you have a whole bunch of people who have done experiments on identically prepared systems. So it's reasonable to ask, what is the average energy that you get out of this whole bunch of measurements? There's uh, Two ways I will show you how to calculate this. The second one is the more standard way of calculating um, that uh, we introduced last time. But if, since this is a simple enough example, you know that the average energy, which I will denote by E, is simply equal to sum over all possible energies weighted by the probability of that particular energy. That's it, right? So this is equal to 
probability of E0 times E0 plus probability of 2E0 times 2E0 plus probability of 3E0 times the energy value 3E0 plus probability of 4E0 times the energy 4E0 plus probability of 5E0 times the energy eigenvalue 5E0. Okay, that's it. And if you add all these guys up, I think you would find something like 52 over 15E0. Uh, Please check if I've done this correctly. There is a rule in which, uh, which we can use to measure the average energies. And this is called the average or expectation value of any operator, which is something that we've already introduced. Expectation value of an operator. The expectation value of an operator can be written as this. And if you have the system in some uh, state psi, the expectation value of this operator is integral psi star sandwich the operator between psi star and psi and integrate. Okay, expectation value of any operator, assuming that you know the state of a system to be some state psi, is simply integral psi star the operator times psi dx. Okay, this is the rule in which you can compute the expectation value of the operator. The expectation value of the operator is basically the average value that you can get. Okay. So in this case, the expectation value of H, you can figure out uh, because you know what psi is, right? So psi is given by this normalized wave function. I'll take out the square root 19 because it cancels between the numerator and the denominator. So this is given by, so there is one over square root of 15 from psi star, one over square root of 15 from psi. So there's an overall factor of one over 15 times integral. Now psi star again has phi 1 star plus 2 phi 2 star plus square root of 2 phi 3 star plus square root of 3 phi 4 star plus square root of phi 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 star times h acting on phi 1 star sorry phi 1 plus 2 phi 2 plus square root of two, five, three, plus square root of three, five, four, plus square root of five, five, five. Okay, so this is H sandwiched between psi star and psi integrated. Now remember that H acts on whatever to the, is to the right of it. That is what operators normally do, but you already know how H acts on all these functions. H acting on phi one gives you epsilon zero times phi one. H acting on phi two gives you two epsilon zero. H acting on phi 3 gives you 3E0. H acting on phi 4 gives you 4 epsilon 0 E0. And H acting on phi 5 would give you 5 uh, epsilon 0. So you know exactly how this works. Now you would have things like phi 1 star phi 1, phi 1 integral phi 1 star phi 1 plus integral phi 1 star phi 2. But again, you use the notion of orthonormality, which we discussed here. And any um, integration which involves one phi one star and anything that is not a phi one will give you identically zero. So out of all these possible um, integrals, only five would survive and you can actually calculate. The act, uh, average value of the Hamiltonian operator is basically epsilon zero over 15 times phi one star phi one integral is one phi two star phi two integral b again one, but there's a two and a two and another two coming from h acting on phi two, which is two epsilon zero. So that gives you eight. Phi three star phi three is one. So there is a square root of two, square root of two plus h acting on phi three is three epsilon zero. So put everything together, you get six. Similarly, you'll get 12 and you get 25 and you'll get, not very surprisingly, the exact same answer you got before. Okay, so the expectation value of an operator or the average value of an operator is basically computed using this particular rule. And this is something you should be very comfortable with. Okay, so the end of it all, the third postulate, which looks a little mysterious, boils down to basically, as a practical measure, boils down to basically write the wave function of the system 
as a linear combination of the eigenfunctions of the operator of interest okay read off or work out uh, but uh, as you keep working out i'm guessing that you will become very proficient and you can simply read off the probability amplitudes as a corresponding coefficients read off the probability amplitudes of measurement let's call them um, qi and compute the associated probabilities mod qi square okay average value if any operator o uh, assuming that the system has been prepared in some state psi is given by integral psi star o psi dx okay and if um, psi is expressed as a linear combination of some operators the computation of this is very easy because uh, the eigenfunctions of a Hermitian operator are automatically orthonormal to each other. Okay. So this is the uh, practical way in which one can uh, use uh, the measurement postulate. Uh, in the next module, we will talk a little bit more about measurement and the notion of uh, commuting and non-commuting operators. And then uh, we will further take it uh, to logically deduct what the uncertainty principle is and we will talk a little bit more about the uncertainty principle. So for now, uh, we will stop here.